How many of you are so excited about this? <laughs> How many of you are really nervous that I'm going to say something inappropriate? <laughs> I'm not going to guarantee that I won't. <laughs> I, I have a friend who always used to say, here's the line, Jody, <laughs> and here's where you are. So I'm going to try, I'm going to really try today not to do that. But I want to just say this. Unequivocally, God created sex. Can you turn to your neighbor and say, God created sex? Some of you are so uncomfortable. <laughs> How many of you are really uncomfortable right now? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I, I just, I'm not going to give you my opinions about things. I'm going to just say the Bible talks about sex a lot. It talks about sex a lot. As a matter of fact, if you go to Genesis chapter 1, the very first commandment that God gave us was to what? Go and multiply. This is not talking about math. <laughs> then shall a man leave his father and mother and the two shall be joined as one Adam and Eve were joined as one and that is I don't know um, so just so you're sure of this your parents had sex <laughs> yeah they did I know <laughs> I know you want to deny it. You don't need to, to picture it, but your, your parents did. And as a result, you are here. And so, so while I, I want to just say this, sex is, it was created by God and it was blessed by God with certain restrictions that we'll get into. Um, we're, I'm going to do this two parts because I really didn't want to rush our prayer for the persecuted church today. I really wanted to make sure that we... Um, took enough time for that. Um, so this week, I'm just going to kind of lay a foundation um, and give some definition of what the Bible has to say about it. But next week, um, we're going to talk about some a little more specific issues, um, including how to spice up the marriage bed. So. <laughs> the newlyweds are like, yeah. <laughs> um, but I want to say this. Okay, so the Bible talks about sex a lot. And it talks about that it is a blessing. It is supposed to be a blessing. It is a gift from God. However, the, the Bible is also very clear about all the distortions that are talked about. There is a lot of mention of adultery, which means to have sex with someone that is not your marriage partner, is not the person that you've committed your life to. Um, there's a story about the, the adulterous woman where you know she comes out and all the Pharisees are throwing stones at her and condemning her. And, and you know, um, Jesus talks to her. She's been married like seven times, and now she's living with this guy. And, and Jesus is like, hey, I'm not condemning you, but go and sin no more. He's telling her, you know, there's, there's an out for this. Um, the story of Samson. As you may know, uh, Samson was controlled by a woman that um, she allured him. Um, the story of David. Uh, you know, you know I, love, I love the fact that the Bible calls David a man after God's own heart. And I think I may have shared this with you, but I remember this one day, I was, I was praying this psalm. It, by the way, if you don't know how to pray, pray psalms. They're prayers that are, that are written for for the glory of God and, and really to connect with our hearts. But I was praying and, and there's this part and, and David is like, you know, give me, a, give me an undivided heart, Lord. Let me, let me serve you. I've lived a blameless life. And, and I just thought, ah, oh, I'm not like David. I haven't lived a blameless life. And I'm like, hey, wait a minute here. I know what he did. He was walking around one night and he looks out and there's this woman taking a bath. And he didn't turn around, you know, like the story of Joseph, where Joseph is like this woman tries to seduce him, and he like runs away, and he even leaves his cloak. But the story of David, he doesn't run away. He fully engages in it, and then he sends for her to have her come so that he can have sex with her, this woman who is not his wife. She was married to another guy who was actually at war. Um, there's a story of Onan. 
I don't know if you guys know about this story, but um, this is a story of a man who dropped his seed. And so there are a lot of people that, that compare this to something else. And we're going to talk about that a little more next week. But the Bible also talks about um, the distortions of sex. Um, there's several mentions of rape. Um, you know, where uh, Amnon comes in and rapes his sister, and then it says, and then after he did that, um, the, the hatred he had for her was more than the desire that he had had for her originally. I mean, there's so many references to sex. But just like that fire in that candlelight service, sex is like fire. And when it's contained and when it's used for the purposes for which it was created, it's a beautiful thing, and it, and it has great benefit and blessing. But when it's out of control and when it doesn't have the boundaries that God has set up for our protection, it can be a very dangerous and damaging thing. And um, I think that's why the Bible is so clear about it. You know, the thing is, and I don't, I, I don't want to get... <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't want to get graphic, but but God knew the purpose for sex, and it's not just to have babies. You know, there there are three responses that people have to sex. Either they become obsessed with it, and it becomes their focus, and everything they think about it kind of becomes their god. Or the pendulum swings so far the other way, and and they get they become repressive, and and they don't think that you should you know that the I mean there are sects throughout um, the Christian Church in history where they think you can't even have sex even if you're married, only for the purpose of procreation. And my question is, why would God have made it so much fun if that was the only reason you were supposed to do it? Right? I mean, God knew what he was doing. He knew all the parts. He knew where the nerve endings would be. He knew where, how everything worked. And he did that on purpose. And I think part of the reason is because he, um, he knew that otherwise men would never come home from the hunt. <laughs> right? So, so we can't be offended I mean, obviously, we don't. We want to have restrictions. We don't want to talk about it in a way that's nasty or in a way that's offensive. But it, it is something that the Bible mentions a lot. Genesis one: Go forth and multiply, replenish the earth, populate the earth. So there's obsession and there's denial. You know, people are like the, the Puritans, where they didn't believe that. I mean, there are even some cults right now that teach that. I mean, I've heard that even in the FLDS right now, and if you come from that background, I, I apologize. I, I'm not trying to be offensive, but what I've heard is that now the mandate is there are only specific, there are 12 specific men who are allowed to procreate with the women. Even married couples aren't allowed to, to um, engage in sex together. These are all distortions, and the world has all these distortions, Right? You go, to, you go to the movies, um, unfortunately, it's like, it's a rare movie that doesn't have some kind of lurid sex scene. All kinds of different perversions. You know, it's like the couple meets, first time they've ever met, and then suddenly they're passionate, and they're, they run into the apartment, and they're ripping each other's clothes off, and it's like, it's been reduced to kind of like animals, you know? And that's a distortion, that is not the way God intended it. God intended it to be a beautiful thing between a husband and a wife within the confines of their marriage. And I, I am not in, I'm not standing in any judgment. Um, I violated that to a large extent before I, I surrendered my life to Christ. And I will just say, if you're a young person and... Um, I just want to say, don't do it. It brought a lot of destruction to my life. It brought a lot of damage. And God was gracious, but about three years into my marriage, it became really, really problematic. The distortions that sex brings can be very destructive 
you know, incest, molestation, rape, date rape, you know, all of these things can bring great harm and trauma, much to the detriment of our souls. And instead, what the Lord had intended was that sex would be a beautiful thing. And I think so many people, I've counseled so many people who struggle in this area because they, they didn't wait. They, they did their own thing. They did, you know, the way of the world like I did. And, um, and it brought destruction. It brings destruction. We think that it's not a big deal. But I wanted to get into the word. Um, oh, I, I'm sorry. The third response that we have is an understanding. And that's what I hope to bring this morning, is that we would have an understanding of what God's will is for us. I want to say, um, for those of you who this might be triggering for whatever reason, whether you have been violated or um, whether or not um, something has happened to you, I, I do want to just pray that um, God would protect you and that you wouldn't be um, traumatized. Uh, but let's get into 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3. So how many of you want to know what God's will is for your life? Really? That's all? Okay. Well, this is for you guys. It says, 1 Thessalonians 4.3, it is God's will. Here it is. This is spelled out as clearly as it can be. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. What does sanctified mean? Sanctified means set apart for the purpose for which you were created. Sanctified means to not, to, to be put into the role. You know, we were all created to worship God. We were created for that. We were all created to serve God and to serve others. These are things we were created for. And when you are doing those things, when you are worshiping God and serving others and serving, and serving the Lord, you are being sanctified. It's being set apart. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. Can you turn to the person next to you and say, this, this is you? It says, it is God's will you should be sanctified that you should avoid sexual immorality. Avoid sexual immorality. Well, what is sexual, sexual immorality? People will always ask me, they'll say, well, the Bible doesn't say that I can't sleep with my boyfriend. People will say this to me. It doesn't say that specifically. Here, it, it is saying this specifically. You should avoid sexual immorality. Immorality is a word that is, it's porneia, which means, you know, that's the root of the word for pornography. But this includes even committed relationships, relationships between, um, between a boyfriend and a girlfriend, you know, I, I remember um, at one point um, I had a, I, I was involved in a relationship and this guy confronted me and he said, hey, aren't you a Christian? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> uh, still your turn. And he's like, he's like, wait a minute, you're, you're not supposed to sleep with me, are you? And I was like, I was so convicted and I was like, um, uh, well, um, uh, uh, I'm in love with you. He goes, oh, so if you're in love with the person, it's okay? I was like, yeah, 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 that's the ticket. <laughs> yeah, then it's okay. This is talking about sexual immorality as in even in committed relationships. This is talking about gay relationships, lesbian relationships, straight relationships. It's talking about prostitution, hookers. It's talking about the things that we watch. It's talking about the things that we do with our bodies. It's talking about even our thoughts. That we're called to avoid sexual immorality. It says, verse 4, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable. It is saying here we can be trained to do this. We can learn to only do those things that honor God with our bodies. You know... The background of this, historically, this, the, the church at Thessalonica, I mean, they make Las Vegas look like preschool. I mean, these guys were perverts. I'll just say it. They were absolutely perverted. 
any kind of sex, any time between anybody, mostly men and men or men with little boys. It was, it was a debaucherous society. And here, Paul's coming in and saying, this is what I'm saying to you. He's saying, learn to control your body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. You know, the thing is, there are restrictions on so many different things that we don't question. You know, there are restrictions on food. I mean, we can't just eat as much as we want. You know, we can't just eat things that are not good for us. I mean, things that are poisonous or whatever. I mean, there are certain restrictions on that. And in the same way, there are restrictions on sexuality based on what Jesus calls us to. And it's, and it, you know, the thing is, it's like sleeping. There's restrictions on sleeping. There's certain things. Sex is a, is a human need. It is a natural thing. It is something that every single person has to contend with. But in marriage, fidelity, and in singleness, contentment. And um, so the term for porneia, for immorality, is basically anything that prepares your body to have sex. You should avoid anything that prepares you to have sex with someone who's not your spouse. So um, I used to tell my kids, don't do anything with the person you're dating that you wouldn't do with your grandma. <laughs> so I ask you, <laughs> Are you doing things with someone that you're not married to that you wouldn't do with your grandma? It says, verse 6, And in this manner, no one should take wrong or advantage of a brother or sister. There are those of you who are taking advantage of somebody else's husband or wife, somebody else's brother or sister. You know, um, even, even looking at, at porn or, um, you know, watching movies that are, you have to think of the people that are in those movies as human beings. You know, the women, those women, are some, that's somebody's daughter. You know, that's, that's potentially somebody's mom, or that's somebody's potential wife. Or the men, you know, that's somebody's brother, or potential dad, or son. To humanize that and to, and to see that, you know, we're taking advantage of these people. I mean, and most of the time they're so broken and they're so devastated and their lives are such a mess. I mean, I knew a woman who was a stripper and she talked about it. She said, I, I cannot get up there without being completely high. And she became a heroin addict. You know, it's, it's not like they're living this life, you know, they try to portray it as if it's this glamorous thing, but it's, it's devastation. It brings destruction. No one should take advantage of a brother or sister. It says, and, and I didn't write this, but this is what it says, the Lord will punish all who commit such sins, as we told you and warned you before. Um, 1 Corinthians 6 does a, does a large uh, expose on marriage and on, on sexuality, if you want to dive into it a little deeper. But again, faithfulness in marriage and we are going to talk next week um, about uh, sex within marriage, but also I'm going to talk to, to singles or those who, um, who are not married to someone else. Um, verse 7 says, God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not need or does not reject a human being, but God the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. You know, having, having sex with a, with a person that you're not married to, you know, what, what porneia means is that, you, that you're, you get stuck to another person. There are literally physical things that take place that bond you. you it creates a, a, a false alliance with that person. There are spiritual bonds that are, that are formed when we go beyond or go outside of God's plan for sex. When we sleep with someone we're not married to, there are actually physical bonds, chemically induced bonds that form. And for every person that you sleep with, 
there's also the ramifications and the and the the destruction that comes from being united with someone else. And it says in 1 Corinthians 6, all other sins are outside the body, but but sexual sins are against your body and they are against the body of Christ. God has a plan for each and every person concerning their sexuality. But God also always, always, always wants to be our everything. He wants to be our fulfillment. He wants to be our source of satisfaction and our source of blessing. So if you have been violated, if you have, you know, been a victim by sexual sin, or if you're somebody who, like me, um, dishonored the Lord with your body, um, I I just want to just offer you hope today. God can restore you. God can make you whole. God is a God of forgiveness. He is a God of cleansing. And it says in 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive us and he will cleanse us from unrighteousness. So I I just want to speak the hope of the Lord to you if you if you've struggled in this area if you if you have violated God's blessings and God's God's law in this area God God has freedom and forgiveness for you there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus you know we sang that today he loves us everything is motivated by God's love for us so could you stand as we close today And, uh, and like I said, next week we'll get a little bit more into some specifics, but um, I just want to speak God's blessing, his healing, his forgiveness, his comfort, his hope over you right now. So Lord, we come before you and we thank you, Jesus, for all your ways. Lord, all your ways are just. We thank you that it is your will that we should live sanctified lives, holy and honorable lives unto you, God. And so, Lord, we just come before you. Can you just lift your hands if, if you don't think that's too Pentecostal? Um, Lord, we just lift our hands to you as a symbol, God. We surrender and we, we thank you and we open ourselves up, God, to living your ways and doing things the way you have called us to do them. Lord, we ask that you would pour out your spirit. I ask that you'd bless these people, Lord God. I pray specifically for those who have been hurt or violated or who have dishonored the, their bodies, Lord um, I just speak your blessing. I speak your cleansing. I speak your forgiveness, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Jesus, we thank you that you went to the cross and you paid the price for our sins. Lord, and you also have promised, Lord, that as we forgive, God, we will be forgiven. And so, Lord, we just release those who have violated us, God. Lord, we just release them to you. Lord, we forgive And we invite you, God, to overwhelm us with your goodness and your love for us. Surpasses knowledge. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Um, If you are somebody, if you'd like further prayer, um, we're going to... We're going to meet you over at the cross. We would love to pray for you for anything. If you have any questions about um, what we just talked about, you're welcome to bring it. Or if you have any other area where you would like to get prayer, please meet us at the cross. Or if you have never come to Jesus, um, today's the day. God bless you. We'll see you next week. 